everyone. Good evening from my end. Um, my name is Mrinal Sinha and I'm an assistant professor in psychology at California State University Monterey Bay. Uh, it is my pleasure to uh, discuss with you today uh, collaborative and team-based learning as it has been engaged in U.S. colleges. Um, and so before I begin with the actual content of this webinar, I'll give you just a little bit of uh, background information to provide you context to understand some of the pedagogical techniques I'm going to share with you. Uh, so California State University with a, a Monterey Bay, the institution that I work at and I'm a professor at, is also the institution that I completed my undergraduate degree. So I have experience not only utilizing these techniques as an instructor, but I have direct experience as a student. Um, uh, using these techniques or experiencing these techniques. And so I think it's important to point out that um, what I'm going to talk about is specific not only to this institution, but to other teaching institutions here in the United States. Um, the California State University Monterey Bay is a primarily a liberal arts college and we are dedicated to teaching. So we are explicitly a teaching institution and that's, where, that's the position I'll be speaking from. I'll also add that um, I am a U.S. born Indian. Uh, my parents both immigrated to the United States from India in the late 60s. Uh, both came from Bihar. And so I experienced all of my, my education here in the U.S., but I have visited India a number of different times. And my wife is also from India and went to medical school there. So I have some rudimentary knowledge about how educational practices are engaged in India. Um, and I'm hoping that some of the pedagogical techniques I'm going to share with you today will be useful. Um, and I'm hoping we can have somewhat of a conversation after I finish this presentation. So to begin, obviously, there are multiple approaches to teaching students in university concepts, uh, university contexts, excuse me, and I'm going to be begin by talking about an educational theorist from Brazil. His name is Paulo Freire, and in 1993 he wrote a book called Pedagogy of the Oppressed. And so he, in this book, provides a critical evaluation of what he calls the banking concept of education. And, and his, his theoretical position emerges from much of the work that he did in Brazil. Um, running literacy programs with peasants in, in that nation. And so in writing this book, he describes the banking concept of education and problematizes this uh, mode of educating students um, because of, of the bi-directional nature of education that he argues for. And he argues that the, bank, the banking concept of education is a unidirectional view of, of how education proceeds. Um, he argues that teachers are, are quote unquote depositors of knowledge and students are basically empty receptacles that are to be filled with that knowledge. Embedded in this assertion are the assumptions that the teacher is the expert and knows everything and students are, are completely ignorant and, and don't have anything to offer the classroom context. So in other words, um, in his conceptualization of, of this banking mode of education, he argues that teachers are the active agents and know everything and it is their job to simply pass on knowledge and fill these receptacles with knowledge. So the teachers are the active agents and students are simply passive receivers of information that are to be, quote, received, filed, and stored. And in essence, he's arguing that this is a passive form of learning, um, as I mentioned before, a unidirectional model of learning, where students are simply passive receivers of the wonderful information that uh, teachers are giving to them. And I do want to point out here the irony. I'm going to be talking to you about interactive modes of teaching and collaborative and team-based modes of teaching. However, in this webinar, I will be using the banking concept of education. And once again, I hope that um, we can perhaps have a discussion after I have exposed you to some of these um, approaches to teaching. So. Um, another approach to teaching in counterdistinction to this banking model is what some have called collaborative learning. And collaborative learning is one of the cornerstones of education as it is manifested here at California State University Monterey Bay. Um, some have argued that collaborative learning refers to an instructional method in which students at various performance levels work together in small groups to it's a common goal. And so this notion of, of students coming in at different performance levels is important insofar as students are conceptualized here as being not only teachers, or I'm sorry, not only students, but also teachers and learning from each other through dialogue as well as learning through direct exposure to course content at the hands of an instructor. 
So within this mode of collaborative learning, students are responsible not only for their own learning, but also for each other's learning. As I mentioned before, through dialogue and sharing each other's experiences and different levels of uh, competency in whatever course content they're being exposed to, um, they, they learn in this manner. So it's, it's a collaborative process. Um, within this this perspective. So as a result, the success of one student helps other students to be successful as well. Um, I have some experience with this, as I mentioned before. Um, I'm an instructor here. I'm a professor here at Cal State Monterey Bay, but I was also an adjunct faculty at a large-scale university. I completed my PhD at the University of California at Santa Cruz, and I worked as an adjunct faculty member there from 2007 to 2011. So I have the experience of not only teaching small classes but also large lecture classes of 200 students plus and so one of the ways that I have engaged collaborative learning in my own personal history was in teaching English composition to freshman level students. Um, at the time, they used to mix the students in terms of their competency level. So they came in and had to take an exam to assess their writing competency. And they would place students that had passed this exam in the same class with students who had not passed this exam. And what ended up happening in these classes, which were relatively small classes, about 25 students, they taught each other tricks that they had utilized in learning how to write and in 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 essence they were helping each other succeed by sharing their own experiences around writing and so this is fundamentally an active form of learning collaborative learning is an active form of learning that requires and ideally increases student engagement so students have an invested interest in in teaching each other as well as learning from the instructor so a little bit more background here at CSUMB, again, collaborative learning is the cornerstone of the pedagogical techniques utilized at this institution. Um, we have a vision statement that was authored in 1994 when the university was founded that reads, we strive for a model pluralistic academic community where all learn and teach one another in an atmosphere of mutual respect and pursuit of excellence. So at this time, I can share a few other um, experiences I've had teaching here at CSUMB that illustrate this point and uh, highlight the importance of collaborative learning. During my time here, I have taught primarily in the psychology department, but I've also taught in other departments. Um, and one of the courses that I taught here, both in an interdisciplinary social sciences program, as well as in the psychology department, was research methods. And in this course, we, we rely primarily on workshops. And so students are asked to complete projects, so we utilize project-based learning, and they do these collaboratively in small groups. And so in this research methods class, I required students to work in small groups. And again, these courses here are, are relatively small. We cap most of the courses at about 30 to 35 students. And so in the research methods class that I'm referring to, uh, the lab required students to collect data and then actually analyze this quantitative data using a software package, a data analysis software package called the Statistical Package for Social Sciences. And so students would be placed into groups that lasted the entire semester, and they would be asked to collect this data and analyze this data collaboratively. And so we have many students here that were not uh, comfortable with the statistical portion. They did not come in at the same levels of competency in their mathematics. And so what ended up happening is the students that were very strong in the mathematics would help explain to the other students the meaning of the different statistical analyses that were produced via uh, the SPSS program. And so again, in essence, what they did is they would collect this data via questionnaires or experiments and then enter this data into SPSS and then analyze this data. And then they were asked to do a write-up collaboratively which they then submitted to me and I gave feedback on it and and it was practice for writing results sections of empirical social scientific papers so this is one example of how collaborative learning is used in a research methods class here at this institution one more example that illustrates uh, this collaborative forms of learning is from a history class that I'm actually currently teaching. It's a, a history class that addresses U.S. history and contemporary society, so 20th century U.S. history 
history, and we asked them to read a book called Overthrow. And in this book, they are exposed to the history of the United States and particularly U.S. imperialism. And it documents the different nations that the U.S. was involved in overthrowing over the past hundred years, beginning with Hawaii, moving through Iran, and a number of different countries. And so after reading the, the book, students are asked in the classroom to draw a map and, and, and conceptualize and highlight the different nations that the United States was responsible or implicated in overthrowing and replacing with a different regime. And so again, we value the different perspectives that students bring to the table. This is fundamentally the assets-based notion of teaching that I highlighted in the description for this webinar. And so they are asked to, again, to, to draw a map that shows the different nations that the U.S. was responsible for overthrowing in the past hundred years. And so again, this is, an, this is embedded in the vision statement that we have here at CSUMB. And so according to the Center for Teaching Excellence at Cornell University, there are a number of benefits that have been empirically demonstrated and, and associated with collaborative learning. These include uh, increased levels of critical thinking as associated with collaborative learning. Um, they've also demonstrated the development of higher level thinking, um, increased levels of oral communication, self-management, and leadership skills. Uh, collaborative learning has also been found to promote student-faculty interaction, which can be particularly important for students here who want to go on to graduate school and are uh, forced to work in an apprenticeship model directly with another faculty member. And so in many cases for students at, in this nation coming from large lecture courses, they have never actually interacted with a faculty member and when they are landed in graduate school are very intimidated and don't understand that faculty are also people that they can relate to. And so collaborative learning has been demonstrated to promote these kind of interactions and make students more comfortable at the graduate level. Um, we've also seen the increase in student retention and a sense of responsibility as associated with collaborative learning, in addition to exposure to and an increase in understanding of diverse perspectives. And again, in our increasingly globalized society, particularly I think in business and perhaps even engineering, where folks are going to have to work with people who come from different cultural and demographic and geographical backgrounds, um, it increases levels of understanding between different people. Um, it's also been shown to uh, increase preparation for real life social and employment situations. And this may be the piece that is most important for engineering colleges in terms of the employment situations that students may encounter um, when they leave college. So what is team-based learning? Team-based learning is fundamentally a variation of collaborative and cooperative learning. Um, it is an instructional strategy that was developed in business school environments in the early 1990s Dr. Larry Michelson. Uh, Dr. My so most of the information I'm going to share with you from this point on in the webinar is derived from the work that Dr. Michelson and his colleagues have, have done in the area of team-based team learning in a variety of different academic disciplines. So Dr. Michelson, in conceptualizing team-based learning and coining the term team-based learning, wanted to capitalize on the benefits of small group learning specifically within the context of large classes. So he was teaching primarily in the business school with large lecture courses of 100, 200, 300 students. Excuse me. And he also wanted to capitalize not just on the lecture format and the ability to expose large number of students to concepts and course material, he also wanted to capitalize on the dialogue that they could have with each other to enlarge their understanding of the content that they were exposed to during lectures. And so a little bit of history here in terms of how um, this particular pedagogical technique has been implicated in the U.S. or implemented in the U.S. Um, is related to a federal granting agency in the United States. In 2001, um, this granting agency awarded funds for educators in the health sciences specifically to learn about and figure out ways to implement TBL or team-based learning in their educational programs. And so today, so a lot of funding was, was, um, was disseminated in order to, uh, to further understand the positive consequences, challenges, etc., cetera, um, in, in the implementation of team-based learning. And so currently, team-based learning is used in over 60 U.S. and international health science professional schools. However, team-based learning has not been limited only 
to these health sciences schools. There's a large body of research that has documented the positive benefits and consequences of utilizing team-based learning in a variety of academic disciplines. Um, and again, this research has, has empirically shown the positive consequences of TBL in business as well as in medicine. Um, some of my own work has demonstrated the ways in which team-based learning can increase student engagement in psychology specifically. We've done some work here at uh, California State University Monterey Bay um, looking at how team-based learning increases scores on tests as well as how it increases student uh, engagement in specific areas of psychology. We focus particularly on introduction to psychology which is a large lecture course taught here as well as in smaller courses like developmental psychology. And so some of my own work has also actually uh, demonstrated some of these principles. Um, Team-based learning has also been used in law as well as in engineering. And I'll talk a little bit about um, some of the details of the benefit um, that have been utilized in engineering specifically towards the end of this particular presentation. So team-based learning, <clears throat> excuse me, team-based learning relies on small group interaction more heavily than any other commonly used instructional strategy in post-secondary education in the U.S. And again, the traditional model of education here in the United States, particularly at large research institutions, utilizes lecture courses where instructors will walk in, give a lecture, have a, mo um, a variety of different TAs, who then work individually with students or teach small, what we call sections, uh, discussion sections, where students can ask more questions and get one-on-one -on -one instruction. And so in the team-based learning model, group work is central to exposing students to and improving their ability to apply this course, concept, this course content. And again, this is in distinction to purely lecture courses. Um, and so again, in distinction to that, the vast majority of class time um, in courses that utilize TBL is used for group work. And this is not to say that lectures have no place in this. However, lectures take a secondary role to the group work that is utilized in this particular model of, of education. So courses taught with team-based learning typically involve multiple group assignments that are designed to improve learning and promote development of self-managed learning teams. And again, this very much fits well with corporate models where students will be asked when they enter the workforce to work in teams. And and many of them will be project managers. And so working with teams and particularly self-managed teams has practical and instrumental consequences for students um, who are exposed to this pedagogical technique. So the primary learning objective associated with team-based learning is to go beyond simply covering content and ensuring that students have the opportunity to practice using the course content to solve problems. And so in essence, team-based learning blends what we call problem-based learning with team-based collaborative learning. And so by problem-based learning, I'm referring to um, courses where students do not necessarily only learn about concepts in a vacuum. And so many of the upper division social psychology classes that I teach talk about different concepts that have been developed by different theorists in the context of social problems. And so we don't simply talk about um, conformity or the power of the situation in isolation isolation from actual real-world problems. And so this can be translated into other disciplines in terms of the specific problems students will deal with when they actually enter the workforce. And, and again, in essence, what we're trying to do here is provide students with not only conceptual knowledge, but also procedural knowledge. How do they take the concepts that they've been exposed to and apply them in real-world context? Specifically, I'm thinking um, maybe for engineering students in the workplace that they will enter. How do they use these concepts in instrumental ways? So the use of, of team-based learning requires modification of uh, requires modification of roles that we traditionally associate with instructor and student. And again, this is grounded in the notion of Freire's notion of uh, the banking model of education. And so TBL uh, modifies this and turns it on its head in some ways. 
Um, and so the instructor's primary role within TBL paradigms shifts from dispensing information to designing and managing the overall instructional process. So it's very much a process-oriented pedagogical technique. So the instructor in this case retains control of the content in terms of the way that they design the course itself. itself. Um, and they act both as a facilitator of students' learning as well as the content expert. And this is one of the important points related to TBL. The instructor must be an expert in the content area. And I'll expand a little bit on that towards the end of this presentation here. Further, the student's role shifts from only being a passive recipient of information to one of accepting responsibility for the initial exposure to the course content so that they will be prepared for the in-class teamwork that they'll be asked to do. So again, this relates explicitly to Freire's criticism of banking models where students are asked to come to class, take notes on the lecture, memorize specific concepts, and then regurgitate that information on a multiple choice test. Um, research has demonstrated that a lot of this information is not um, is not retained after a period of time. Um, people doing this research in introduction to psychology have, have demonstrated this in quasi-experimental designs. They would give students uh, exams in their introduction to psychology class, record their scores, and then give them the exam again in the following semester to see how much of the information they actually retained. Uh, this research demonstrated that they didn't remember the specific concepts that they were exposed to. However, they did remember the different activities they were asked to engage in. So they remembered the process of the learning, but not necessarily the specific content itself. And so again, team-based learning in many ways is focused more on the process that is designed to deepen students' knowledge in a way so that they can integrate the information into their everyday thinking and ideally apply it in, in, their, work, uh, in their work or professional lives. So there are the nuts and bolts of team-based learning. There are four essential elements, or what Michelson calls the pillars of team-based learning. And these are, these are related primarily to the instructor's role in the class. And so these four elements are groups, um, the groups must be properly formed and managed. Accountability. Uh, accountability is the cornerstone of team-based learning. This does not work unless students are held accountable for the quality of the work that they do individually, as well as the work that they engage in the groups or teams they are assigned to. Uh, team-based learning also requires feedback. Students must receive frequent, excuse me, and timely feedback. Finally, the last essential element here for team-based learning is the assignment design itself. The group assignments themselves must promote both learning and team development. So the, the assignment design must include not only the concepts that they are introduced to via their readings and the short lectures provided by instructors, but it must also include process-oriented assignments that that promote cohesion within the group and learning from each other. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to expand on each of these different essential elements in the slides which follow. So the first essential element of team-based learning is the formation of groups. These groups need to be formed strategically by the instructor and need to be formed according to some intentional criteria. So in other words, we in, in this team-based learning paradigm, students should not self-select the groups that they are going to be in for the entire semester. What in many cases will occur, should students self-select, is what are called coalitions within groups. And so if there are um, students that are friends with each other before entering the class, these students may form coalitions with each other that silence of silence mem other members of their groups. So again, the instructor must be in charge of forming these groups. And again, according to some intentional criteria, the examples given here are demographic characteristics or perhaps even performance in previous courses. Um, in many cases, this is a complicated way of assigning groups. Um, folks working in law and in business schools have actually 
distributed questionnaires at the beginning of classes, particularly on the first day. And they will have students fill out these demographic questionnaires in addition to including courses they've taken and the grades that they received in those courses. And then they will actually assign the groups based on varying performance levels, perhaps different demographic characteristics. At our institution here at CSUMB at California State University Monterey Bay, we are a Hispanic serving institution. Um, we are one of the more diverse campuses in the United States. And so our, our classes are characterized by, by students coming from working class backgrounds who are first generation in college. Uh, uh, many of them are Latino or Mexican descent. We have African Americans, um, as well as as European American, and a very small number of Indian students. I was one of maybe five Indian students <laughs> attending this institution when I went to school here. And so the logic here is to create diverse groups in the first few weeks of class, ideally the first week of class, because the more diverse the group is, the more likely it is that members will bring different perspectives to the task that they're asked to complete. This in many cases will result in a richer discussion of course content and the problems that they'll be asked to solve. Now I can give you a couple of examples of how this is played out at the institution I reside at now. Um, again I'm one of the few Indian uh, uh, instructors here at this institution. I'm the only one in the psychology program and in many of the courses that I teach again relatively small courses of about 30, 35 students, um, I will talk to them about cultural variation in regards to a number of different social psychological phenomenon. And I'll actually share with them at times uh, my own experience of having an arranged marriage. Um, I, I, I had an arranged marriage with a woman from India, as I mentioned to you before. She was a medical doctor, grew up in Pondicherry. Um, and I share with them how many of the assumptions that they hold regarding love and marriage are disrupted when you go into different cultural contexts. And so I share this with them, break them up into small groups, and have them talk about how they experience their own cultural background as an asset and what that helps them bring to the classroom. And so this can be translated into the collaborative activities that students are asked to do within the context of their own groups. And again, in many cases, this results in very rich conversations around what in other classes may be very dry discussions of a definition of this concept or another one. And so as I mentioned, member diversity within the groups becomes an asset, especially as time passes, the group and the groups work together successfully and as group, as group cohesiveness develops and solidifies. And again, this is contingent on the facilitation of the instructor as well as the assignments that the instructor uh, designs for the students to complete. Um, and this is a very important point here, and this is one of the uh, major distinctions between team-based learning and collaborative learning. The groups must be permanent for the entire term. If these groups are not assigned as a permanent um, phenomenon, and, and members are jumping from one group to another, then group cohesiveness is, is uh, is compromised. And so this is a very important point for team-based learning and frankly it is the hallmark of team-based learning. This does not work unless the groups are permanent for the entire semester or quarter. The second uh, essential element of team-based learning is accountability. And as I mentioned before, accountability is the cornerstone of team-based learning. This, this pedagogical technique does not work unless students are held accountable not only to the instructor, but also so to their group members in terms of the quality and the quantity of the individual work that they are asked to do. Um, the teams must also be accountable for their work as a unit and again um, in corporate or workplace context this is the way that things go down is, is everyone work in teams. Very few of us work in isolation. Um, and so this account, this notion of accountability is accomplished via what Michelson and his colleagues call readiness assurance. And so readiness assurance is, is accomplished by having students read outside of class. So, so students are required to obviously read material um, before they come to class. And this may also include podcasts, TED Talks, and other forms of media 
media that they are exposed to. Some have called this the flipped classroom. In many cases, students are actually asked to watch documentaries or specific movies and then asked to come to class ready to discuss these things. Um, from a more pragmatic perspective, this readiness assurance is accomplished through what Michelson and his colleagues call an individual readiness assurance test, an IRAT. Um, this particular test is a short, basic, multiple choice test about the preparation materials. So an example of this would be in the psychology courses that I've taught, I will assign them a number of chapters, maybe two or three chapters from the book, and then they will come to class and they will be given this IRAT, and they will be asked to complete this test um, during class. After they finish the, the IRAT, then they are asked to do the, the TRAT, the Team Readiness Assurance Test. So once students turn in their individual tests, they then get into their teams and are asked to take the exact same test again, and they must come to a consensus on what the team's answers are going to be. And so again, this is where the diversity of the group comes into play, where students are asked to have conversations with each other in terms of why do we want to answer in this particular way. In many cases, what ends up happening is one student or two students will take on the role of teacher within the context of the group or the team and they will negotiate how the consensus is going to come to be. And so this is one way that readiness assurance and accountability is accomplished within the context of TBL or team-based learning. The third essential element of team-based learning is feedback. So teams must get immediate feedback on their performance. Um, Michelson and his colleagues in the, in the late 90s developed a scratch-off form in the immediate feedback loop here. So what they did is they designed questions that they would pose to the class, to the teams, um, and the individuals, and uh, well, specifically the teams, and they would they would pose the question, and the teams would be given a p a piece of paper that had scratch off uh, scratch off on them, and they would be given these multiple choice tests, and they would be asked to scratch off what they think is the correct answer. If they scratched off the correct answer, there would be an X there, and they would receive full credit. If they scratched off the incorrect answer, they would be given another chance, and every time that they missed it, they would lose points as they went through it. And so again. This is the um, quintessential piece of providing feedback to the students. And so the students would miss questions or get questions right. And this is where the instructor's expertise comes into play. The instructor would then basically give an impromptu lecture based on the questions that the students missed in this particular test that they were given, and then they can cover more content. In many cases, the perception is less content gets covered if you do group work. However, if the instructor is knowledgeable about the content area, they can see what, what areas of content do not need to be covered because the students got those questions right. So they already understand that, and it would be redundant to cover that in a lecture. And so they can fill in gaps in students' knowledge in the lecture that they give. However, again, this can be very challenging um, unless you are very comfortable with, with doing these kind of on-the-fly lectures based on students' responses. Another piece of the feedback loop here relates to appeals. And so in Michelson's conceptualization, team-based learning, when teams felt as though they could make a case for their answers that were marked as incorrect, they were allowed to use their course material to generate written appeals. And these general written, these written appeals that were generated were required to be consisting of a clear argumentative statement and evidence cited from the preparation materials that buttressed their argument for why they felt their answer was actually incorrect. And this may seem like a way of undermining the instructor's uh, authority. However, it increases engagement on the part of students and facilitates their engagement in the classroom context itself. So the fourth essential element here is assignment design. And again, this is part of the instructor's responsibility in terms of scaffolding students through the curriculum. And so Michelson and his colleagues call this the four S application activities. Um, these assignments must address a significant problem that demonstrates a concept's usefulness. And it needs to be made visible to the students why this particular problem is significant. And so if, 
if we take, for example, um, in engineering, perhaps making it visible to the students how a particular social problem or a specific uh, uh, workplace problem is important in engineering professions, then students will be more likely to be engaged and invested in trying to uh, solve this particular problem. So the, again, the first um, S here is significant problem. The second one is making sure that there is a specific choice among clear alternatives. So for example, which of, which of these is the best example of X? What is the most important piece of evidence in support of Y? So there needs to be a specific set of choices, so multiple choices for students to choose from in providing an answer to the problem-based activity they are engaging. Further, all of the teams in the classroom are must be working on the same problem as the other teams, so each team will be invested in and care about the conclusion and rationales that the other teams provide in buttressing the answers or arguments that they're presenting. Um, further, um, the assignment design requires that students simultaneously report their decision so that differences among the teams can be explored for optimal instructional effect. And this is really where the collaborative piece becomes most uh, galvanized or concretized. Um, in the classroom context, all teams will be asked, in many cases they'll have a poster board, and they will indicate our answer is A. And everyone does it at the same time, so that if one team, it's, we can avoid the problem of one team going first and saying A, and then all the other teams saying, oh, well, well, we're going to change our answer because of them, even if that answer is incorrect. Further, it facilitates conversation not only within groups, but it facilitates conversations across groups in essence, making visible to the instructor where some of the gaps in knowledge for the students lie. So, to summarize these basic, uh, basic components of team-based learning, again, team-based learning requires intentional strategic formation of permanent groups by the instructor. Typically, this occurs on the first day of class unless instructors wish to use demographic questionnaires in forming the groups, in which case this should occur within the first or second week of class. Um, TBL also requires students to be prepared before class. If students have come in and not done the reading, then none of these other activities or assignments will work. And as I mentioned before, uh, the preparation and accountability is accomplished via what Michelson and his colleagues call the readiness assurance test, the individual level assurance test, as well as the team-based ones. It also requires frequent and timely feedback on the instructor based on the test scores and usually accomplished via a short lecture addressing incorrect test answers. And again, this allows the instructor to actually cover more content than they otherwise would have if they had only used um, traditional lecture-based modes of teaching. Um, another um, component that I've discussed here is requiring assignments that, are, that students perceive as relevant and have specific answers that can be shared simultaneously to uh, facilitate within and between group discussions, as I mentioned previously. Team-based learning also requires, as I mentioned before, the instructor to be the expert in the content areas. At our institution, this is one of the challenges, is finding people that can address these things in an expert manner, um, because many of these short lectures must be given, quote unquote, on the fly, um, based again on the gaps in knowledge that students demonstrate via their discussions and scores on these different tests. Um, from an administrative uh, perspective, um, TBO requires buy-in from faculty, students, and administrators. And so faculty that do not necessarily believe that this is the best way to teach students probably should not use this technique because it requires an investment and time um, in designing the course materials. Further, it requires pedagogical transparency. On the first day of class, the instructor must explain the logic behind team-based learning so that students understand the utility of the required activities. So in other words, students need to understand why they're being asked to do the things they're asked to do. Um, this is a, a drastic departure from traditional modes of education and can create cognitive dissonance for students 
excuse me, in many cases. And so again, pedagogical transparency is paramount when using team based learning. Um, students need to understand the principles behind it so they understand why they're doing the things that they're doing and understand the instrumentality um, for their professional careers in engaging the activities. Finally, uh, team-based learning requires that the curriculum be organized into quote-unquote units or modules so that learning of course concepts can be scaffolded across the term in manageable or digestible chunks. And so one example I can give you from my experience of teaching Introduction to Psychology is actually grouping the sub-disciplines of psychology, so for example cognitive psychology, social psychology, clinical psychology, into different modules so we can cover specific concepts that are important within these subfields in a way where they master them in chunks and so most of these chunks or modules occur over a two to three week span and students are asked to master them in a manner that is scaffolded across the entire term and in a way that they get to apply the different ideas they've been exposed to to deepen their engagement and to be able to integrate the concepts into their everyday thinking. So some of the benefits that have been empirically demonstrated um, in team-based learning um, include the promotion of active learning without requiring large numbers of faculty facilitators. So at our institution, again, we have small classes, and so we are spread very thin uh, where we have five classes of 30 people and that requires five instructors. However, if you were to collapse those and have a class of 130, you would only require one faculty facilitator and you could have multiple teams within the context of that classroom. And so in many ways, this is pragmatic and efficient in increasing active learning. Um, the benefits that have been demonstrated empirically also have shown that there's higher levels of student engagement um, and this has been demonstrated particularly in medical schools um, or introduction to chemistry classes. Um, we've seen increased examination scores um, again in medical colleges as well as in some of the health science fields as being associated with team-based learning. Um, in engineering colleges some of the research has also demonstrated that there are higher retention rates um, in keeping students specifically within the major so not necessarily within the institution but team-based learning has been shown to increase the retention of students within the major of engineering. And so I would like to close the webinar with an African proverb that I think is illustrative of the positive consequences of utilizing team-based learning. Um, the African proverb reads, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And I feel that this relates to team-based learning insofar as the techniques utilized here are designed to increase student engagement and deepen their thinking, not only in terms of the concepts by themselves, but the concepts and in terms of their utility in the context of specific social problems and so, or, or, or specific problems that are engaged within different academic disciplines. And so, as I mentioned, if you want to go fast, then go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. And I will end my webinar with this and open this up for any questions or conversations that folks might like to engage. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, how can we monitor PBL for large classrooms when teaching assistants are not available? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? How can we monitor TBL for large classrooms when mm -hmm. teaching assistants are not available? Well, now this is a challenge within large classes. One of the things that we've done here is we so we don't have any we don't have any a graduate program in the psychology department here. So what we've done is we utilize senior level students um, as we we don't call them teaching assistants, but we call them course assistants. And these are still undergraduate students, and they function in very similar ways as teaching assistants. And so we have them uh, monitor that. If those types of students are not available, another way of monitoring these practices could be actually 
going around the room. So actually wandering from each of each team to each team, um, or incorporating other accountability. Um, um, devices. And so in business and law specifically, um, many instructors have actually utilized contracts where each team will actually draw up a contract that each team member is required to sign. And so everyone is required to adhere to this specific contract of, of activities and engagement um, that each student is responsible for, for performing. And so that could be a mechanism that could be put in place in large lecture classes where teaching assistants are not necessarily available. So if there are not undergrad graduates that can be utilized or if the class is too large for the instructor to actually go from each group to each group, there can be actual uh, written assignments or written um, mechanisms um, to ensure the accountability of students completing these things. Um, another idea, um, and again, you know, Michelson and them were utilizing these techniques in the late 90s. Technology can also be utilized, I think, in present day where students can be asked to enter, we, we call them clickers here, where they have devices that are hooked into the actual online learning system. And they can be asked to submit assignments at specific times as they complete the activities themselves. Does that answer the question? I, uh, we'll wait for it to answer and take the next question. If students are not sincere enough to read content before class, how can we proceed with flip class? How can we proceed with flip class? Well, again, this, this particular teaching technique requires that students have come in with that knowledge. Um, if we wish to be coercive, one of the ways of ensuring this is actually in the grading process itself. And so, Many instructors have actually provided um, more weight to the individual readiness tests, uh, wherein you know 60% of the student's grade is based on the individual tests that they're asked to complete. And so if they continually come not prepared, then they will not pass the class. Um, in terms of a flipped classroom, <sighs> that's a difficult question to ask. If students are not motivated to come, Again, this, this technique doesn't necessarily work. Well, I suppose in a flipped classroom, what one could do is if students do not come prepared, then they can put them in these collaborative groups and actually ask students to teach each other. There's actually another um, technique technique that is collaborative in nature. It's not technically team-based learning, but it is a collaborative technique. It's called the jigsaw technique. It was originated by Air, Elliot Aronson over at Stanford University. And what they did is they broke students up into different teams. I utilized this technique when I was a graduate student when we would review for exams and I would break the groups up into team, uh, the class up into different groups. And they would be assigned one chapter that was going to be covered in the exam. And each of the groups would be responsible for coming up with the answers to the different review questions that were posed in the review sheet and would talk to each other about them and then would do a, uh, a short presentation in the class and be responsible for teaching the rest of the class the content that was covered in that particular chapter. And so it's called the jigsaw technique where students are asked to teach each other, not only in small groups, but also in presenting that material to the entire section. Does that answer the question? Can we encourage presentations after TBL on the same? I'm sorry? Can we encourage presentations after TBL? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, many, in fact, in, in my introduction to psychology class, um, their final project is actually a presentation that they do in groups. And so they are actually required to present um, 
they the results of the specific problem they've been asked to address. So here's an example. One of the assignments that I will give asks students to find a social problem that exists in a global context. And so in many cases, students will choose the, pro the, the social problem of hunger or the social problem of uh, depression or something along those lines and present the problem itself, present evidence that the problem exists, and then actually present potential solutions that can be that can be utilized from the discipline of psychology in alleviating um, the social problem they've elected to uh, to address and so yes absolutely those small group assignments that are designed you can add a presentation component to it so it could it could be varied in terms of simply holding up a sign that tells everyone the answer, students can be actually asked to give formal presentations to the larger class. Um, and I actually found that this is a much more motivating factor for students than simply holding up a sign, frankly, because they don't want to look stupid in front of the rest of the class. And so it's basically a, a formal presentation um, the stress brought on by speaking in front of groups of people is another motivating factor that can be utilized. So the short answer is yes. Uh, how can we involve students effectively throughout a course of 60 classes in of undergraduate how engineering subjects? Of, of how many classes? 60. 60. So the, the class size is 60 or 60 courses? Uh, I, I think they mean uh, class size. Okay, so can you repeat the question for me one more time? I'm sorry. How do we involve students effectively throughout the course? Throughout of the course. 60? Okay, okay. Well, um, one of the ways of doing this, I would argue, is is embedded in the, the design of the course itself. And so if a course can be scaffolded effectively towards some goal at the end, and so if there is some product at the end that students are required to do, this can continually engage them. So one way I've done this in my research methods courses, um, and again, that the course of, of research methods is only about 35, um, and so I'm not sure if this could translate into a class of 60. However, um, one way of doing this is having each activity that they do build towards a final project. And so here's the example I've used in my research methods courses. Students will be required to engage each phase of the research cycle. And so the first assignment will require them to review the literature, provide annotations of this, and present this to the class in light of a particular topic that they would like to do for their research project at the end. The next piece is them operationalizing different variables that they would like to measure in the project that they would like to do. And then they actually engage different data analytic techniques. And then at the very end of it, all of these different assignments that they do build toward the final project at the end of the class. And so scaffolding students effectively via the assignments presented to them is one way of keeping them continually involved over the course of a semester. Again, it requires there to be some kind of grand project or grand assignment at the end so that they are motivated to complete these different all our assignments at each step. Could you open your chat? Uh, this question is rather long. I uh, can read. Yeah. Let me find the chat. Um, so, now, where, where would I find the the, the chat component here? Uh, it should be the last tab on your control panel. Ah, okay. I see it. I see. Um, okay. Is it this question, the main challenge that comes from the yes. student? 
Okay, okay. So the main challenge that comes from the student quarters, especially in terms of their enthusiasm for learning. So I'd like to know about what preparation techniques you suggest to make student participation effective. Well, let's see. So the preparation techniques that I have utilized to make the student participation effective, well, again, this may sound somewhat coercive. Um, one of the things that we've done in, um, I'll give you two examples and hopefully they will be, they will be somewhat um, useful here. In the social psychology class that I teach, I actually require students to read a different set of articles for each module that they engage, and they are required to submit a response paper. And so I, I give them an assignment that has very specific questions that they're to respond to in light of the readings that they've been assigned. And they are asked to submit those response papers five minutes before class begins. And if they do not submit those class assignment, the, the written assignments, to, before class begins, they are not eligible to receive any participation points for that day. And so this is one way, again, it's somewhat coercive, but they, if they do not turn in the, the response paper, um, in other words, if they are not prepared to speak in class, not only do they lose the points um, for the response paper, but they also lose points in terms of their attendance and their participation. Participation. Um, so it's kind of a, it's a double whammy in some ways, and so I try to coerce them into doing these things, um, and I make sure that the way that the points are allocated in the class, about 40% of their grade emerges from those response papers as well as their participation in class. Um, so that's one way that I have tried to do this. Um, another way is in terms of um, having them annotate different ideas or emailing them before class begins and telling them this is what we're going to do in class today and in fact what we're going to do and again this works mainly for small classes so in classes that I have that are between 25 and 35 we will actually sit in a circle and everyone will be asked to share a quote from the readings that we've done um, or share an idea from the readings that they've been exposed to and talk to the class. And we actually go around the circle and everyone is required to talk about their reflections on the reading or what they learned from the specific course content itself. And so again, and this is somewhat related to that notion of having them doing oral presentation. It makes them accountable in a public way. Did that answer the question? There's another question in the chat. Oops. Okay. All right, I'm reading it here. So if we work with team-based learning in class, it may take more time to complete course. When our institute is affiliated with the central university, timing to complete a course is one constraint. How do we effectively use TBL in this case? Hmm. Well, so I don't I don't have a lot of experience with this particular phenomenon. If this is the case, what I would probably suggest is is creating fewer modules. And so this again requires instructor expertise in terms of their discretion and knowing what are the most important things that students must learn when using TBL. One of the other components of TBL that I did not mention explicitly here is when designing the course is what they call designing it backwards. And so instead of saying, what are the specific concepts we want students to be exposed to, uh, a different question would be, what are the specific things that we want students to be able to do? And then after determining what are the things or skill sets um, or what are the tasks that they should be able to do, we work backwards from there. And so we design the course based on what things will we like them to do. One of the examples that Michelson and his colleagues have provided is imagining that the students in our classes now at one day become our colleagues and are doing something that communicates to us, oh, what we did really worked because they are putting these ideas into practice. And so thinking about designing the curriculum backwards might be one way of reducing the amount of course content that needs to be covered 
in light of this affiliation with another university where timing is of the essence. And so again, it requires um, discretion on the part of the instructor and doing so in a way that highlights what is the most important things that students need to learn in terms of what they can do when they finish the class. I hope that answers the question. So that was the last question. Thank you very much, Dr. Zimmer. And if I get any more questions by email, I'll forward them to you. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Thank you for the time, everyone. It was my pleasure. Bye. Goodbye.